is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 191, covering the week of October 14th through October 18th, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute and subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to find all those social media accounts, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all our social media buttons. You'll also see our Amazon Smile button. Click on that, and while you're shopping at Amazon, you can make us your preferred charity. So while you buy stuff, we get a few pennies. It's a great way to support the Institute by doing nothing except shopping at Amazon. While you're there, also give us an email address at abbevilleinstitute.org. We'll give you a free ebook, and you get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also, download our free mobile app. Just go to your app store, search for Abbeville Institute, and you get the app. You'll get access to the podcast, all of our audio lectures. It's a great way to keep up with the Institute on the go. Also... Go to that webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a tab that says support. Click on that. You've got donor options. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like the podcast, if you like the website, if you like our programs, if you like our lectures, go ahead and click on that. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. It is all tax deductible to the full extent of the law. So please consider us in your financial plans. You can also click on that support tab and there'll be a little tab that says shop, click on that. It'll take you out to our online apparel store where you can get your shirts, golf shirts, hats, golf towels, all kinds of stuff. So you can support the Institute that way and also advertise the Institute that way. So we got a lot of great stuff going on. We do have a couple of projects in the background that are going to happen within the next six months, maybe earlier on one of those. So uh, there are things that we are doing that we will ask for support. Uh, financial support, and uh, we do appreciate everything you do provide. Um, So remember, tax deductible, you got the end of the tax year coming up. If you want to make a donation, you want to save a little money on taxes, it's a great way to do it. All right, so we've got a lot of good stuff this week, and in fact, the theme for the week uh, is Jeffersonianism. Um, And this is, of course, the core of the Abbeville Institute. People ask all the time, you know, what is the mission of the Institute? Well, it's to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And so when you say the Southern tradition, what is that? And of course, we talk a lot about culture on this program. And even one of the pieces, the piece on Wednesday does talk about culture. But at the end of the day, the Southern tradition was best defined by essentially Thomas Jefferson. Now, Jefferson was in his own state, a reformer. So a lot of conservatives, and we have a lot of conservative listeners, bristle at the idea of Thomas Jefferson being their guy. Now, of course, we can, Jefferson was such a complex man that you can, Jefferson can be almost anyone to anything. And uh, I wrote a piece years ago entitled, We Are All Jeffersonians. Um, But the fact is, Jefferson really does help to find the Southern tradition. Now, even in the 19th century, there were Southerners that said, no, no, Jefferson is way off. And of course, they're battling this idea of all men are created equal. What does that actually mean for America? What does it mean for the South? And when you have uh, the Proposition Nation folks, of course, them, Thomas Jefferson really is the embodiment of American ideals, idealism, because of that line, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And what does it actually mean? We could debate that all day. We could have piece after piece on that particular line and what it means or what it doesn't mean and what historians have said it meant and what it doesn't mean and what uh, politicians have said it means and what it doesn't mean. We could, we could do this all day. The fact is, though, Jefferson, not just in uh, Virginia, but um, overall, was someone who was concerned about tradition. What do I mean by that? As I said in the piece that I wrote, and of course Clyde Wilson has a wonderful piece, Jefferson the Conservative. Um, Jefferson's ideas of reform stopped at his mountains. Jefferson never viewed his reform impulse to move beyond Virginia. And a recent biography of Thomas Jefferson uh, by Kevin Gutzman 
outlines that, look, Jefferson was a committed federalist, meaning that he was interested in real federalism. So the states were prime, that primacy in this general government. And that's one of the most important things. Jefferson was also an agrarian. And that agrarian life, um, you can either look at it in two ways. Look, I mean, the Romans considered agrarianism to be reform. It was radical to be an agrarian. The, the Gracchi uh, were uh, radical reformers who were uh, certainly interested in land redistribution. And if you look at the agrarians of the middle of the 20th century, and then some of the other Europeans like Chesterton and Belioc, they were certainly interested in what's called distributism, which was take all land that's not being used by corporations and give it back to people. You need small independent farmers. That's where Jefferson's mind was. You need small independent farmers because the independent part is key. In other words, it was a rural philosophy. Jefferson was highly suspicious of urbanism, and rightly so, because urbanism creates its own problems. And if you look at American politics, and if you look at what's happened in America in the last, say, 20 years, and you look at political BAPs and how things are shaking out, generally what we're seeing is that urban areas vote one way and rural areas vote the other way. And if you look at election maps, these concentration of voters in urban areas is getting smaller and smaller, and you have places like uh, California or New York or Boston or uh, Chicago, you're having these urban areas begin to dominate. Even in the South, you know, Atlanta is doing this now. This is why people think Atlanta is going to move maybe further to the, or Georgia is moving to the left because of Atlanta. Um, you have these urban areas that are dominating the rest. And of course, urban areas, uh, when, when you talk about immigration and other things, urban areas are magnets for these. So um, this urban-rural split was very important, even in Jefferson's time. And so Jeffersonianism, if there is an ideology, which I don't, tradition is not an ideology, but certainly sometimes people say Jeffersonianism. But uh, what we're really talking about is a defense of tradition. Again, Jefferson was a reformer in Virginia, and he was considered on the left of those in Virginia. He would never be confused with some of the conservatives in the state. But he certainly was a dedicated traditionalist in that he believed in federalism and the states should be primary in this American experiment. And, I mean, on some issues, he was a traditionalist, even in his own state. So uh, there is certainly much to be said for the Jeffersonian agrarian order. Uh, and you had people like John Taylor of Caroline, who, were, who was a staunch expositor of that particular agrarian order. If you read any of John Taylor of Caroline's works, most importantly, Eritor, which is his agricultural treatise. And he has got some great lines in that book. Um, you know, and I'm going to paraphrase, but if uh, agriculture is bad, government's going to be bad. I mean, he believed that farmers were the backbone of American society. Now, fast forward to the 21st century, we don't have so many farmers anymore. We've got a lot of corporate farmers so the small independent farmer is almost gone. He's vanished. We still have them, just not as many. Um, and so what do we do in this new suburban urban environment? How do we maintain a Jeffersonian position in an urban suburban environment? That is the question. And this is something that we try to explore in the Southern tradition and how that could help with this monstrosity of America. And it's not just here. I mean, we're looking at this all over the world. All over the Western world, the small farmer, and this is what people were pointing out in the 30s, was vanishing. The backbone of Western civilization, and you can go all the way back to Rome for this, or even Greece, but certainly Rome, where you have the small farmer that created that Roman citizen that was so important to early Roman society, disappeared with Latifundia, and then, of course, into feudalism and where they became serfs. But then you had a, a, a resurgence of that, and so you had this small farmer and you had these things. But certainly, um, as we've seen that disappear in America, you lose that independence that comes with farming. As we've mortgaged ourselves, as we've adopted this Hamiltonian economic system where everyone's in debt over their eyeballs and you can't get out of it anymore, things have become so expensive 
Um, it's very hard not to do it. This is where you know people like Dave Ramsey and others who try to in, uh, uh, teach people to live on cash and no debt. I mean, these things, that's basically a Jeffersonian position, even though Jefferson himself was heavily in debt on land. But the idea of independence is what we're talking about here. Independence. And so that independence creates a culture. And that culture um, is very much Southern. So what does that actually mean? And the first piece of the week was by so a new writer, Leslie Alexander. She wrote a piece about moving to Dallas. Now, I think she said she's from Louisiana, and she moves to Dallas, Texas, and was shocked by what she found in Dallas, Texas. In other words, she moved from a rural area of the South into an urban area of the South. I mean, Dallas is still in the South, but it's different. And it's different because she doesn't recognize much of what's going on there because it is further left. I mean, places like Dallas and Houston and Memphis and Nashville and Atlanta, you have these urban southern centers that are not necessarily in line with rural southern culture. They're not southern. Uh, I live in an urban area. My wife is from a rural area in the south and she's always remarked that in this urban area we've lived for over a decade it doesn't feel very southern because it's not i mean you have it's an area that has a large number of transient people it just doesn't feel as southern as where she grew up and it's not uh, you get outside of that area though into the into the more rural areas around us and you can find it but it's when you go into the urban areas where of course a lot of people have to work and uh, then they are forced to live there. Uh, it's you, you don't have that feel. Um, a lot of that has to do also with a with a large military installation. So you have people coming from all over the country and all over the world into this region, and so they don't. They're just not. Uh, a lot of them are not southern, so they they change the character of the area as well. But certainly, um, you have this uh, this urbanism that's creating a different kind of climate. And this is a wonderful piece. Now, we had a lot of feedback from this. And one individual said, well, look, I mean, this is she she complained about uh, not seeing a whole lot of English speakers in Dallas. And he said, well, look, you're in Texas. Texas has always had a long history with Mexico. This is true. I mean, I mean Texas is right on the border of Mexico. You're going to have uh, a large interaction between American uh, American Texans and Mexican Texans. And that was the case even back in the 19th century. So you're going to see more Spanish speakers in Texas. But what she also complained about, or at least remarked on, maybe not a complaint, it was, I mean, it was something that she just didn't feel at home there, um, were people that were culturally different than she was. And then we had a, somebody email us from California and said, look, this we moved from California to Dallas. It's all in perspective. Dallas is a, is a hundred times better than anywhere in California. But this brings up the point. You know, so you have people coming in from California, and yeah, I mean, it's it's nicer than uh, than uh, California, Dallas is. But it's if you're coming from a real southern area, Dallas is not going to be the South. So, what is the South? I mean, how, and, and she says that she's going to try to find her her people, right? She's going to try to find that in Dallas, and it's going to be hard. But she has this melancholy, this longing for a place that's not there anymore. And she tells wonderful stories about her family and growing up and how that was different than what Dallas is and what the region around Dallas, even the suburban areas. Now, again, it's all perspective. It depends on where you're coming from. If you are coming from California, well, I'm sure Dallas seems like an absolute utopia because anyone coming from California... Now, North Cali Northern California has got some nice places um, and you have some good people out there. Uh, but they're getting tired of, of where California is headed, so they're moving to other places of, of the United States. So um, this is an interesting piece, and it gives perspective on things. And then on Wednesday, we had a piece by Nicole Williams, who's written for us before. And again, it's about culture, and she talks about the decline of the rural South and what that means for Southern culture and Southern society and how these cities are becoming such magnets for, again, business, industry. It's always been that way, but a lot of people are, the, the, the rural South is declining. This is what the agrarians pointed out in the 19, 1930, I'll take my stand, or 1936, 
uh, Who Owns America, which is a great book, by the way, that a lot of people haven't read. They've read Maybe I'll Take My Stand, but not Who Owns America, which is a fantastic follow-up uh, because it just completely rips apart the Hamiltonian system and, ha and Hamilton's America. But you have that particular book, and these books, and they were pointing us out, 1930, what we're doing, we're losing rural America. And they weren't losing it in 1930. They hadn't lost it yet. It was still there. I mean, the Southern tradition in rural society was still there, but they recognized that this is going to be gone before we know it. And if that's the case, we're really in trouble. The Southern tradition, Southern culture, Southern society is really in trouble once we lose this rural anchor to America. And so these two pieces are nice in that they work very well together. And one, Williams's piece is a little more analytical, using data and other things to describe the decline of the rural South. Alexander's piece is um, a little more poetic and what this means for people, the human cost of urbanism and the loss of the Southern tradition. What is the human cost of that? And probably one of the best literary figures to deal with in the 20th century is Wendell Berry, which is why on Tuesday we ran a review uh, published from republished from Law and Liberty, but uh, of a uh, Library of America, New Library of America book on Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry is the Kentucky Bard. We've run pieces on Wendell Berry before. Wendell Berry is often considered a leftist, but what Wendell Berry is more than anything else is a Jeffersonian. And he's great that way. And I think that um, Barry has certainly has some left views, leftist views on social issues. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but he is a quintessential agrarian Jeffersonian Southerner. Uh, and his books are fantastic, again, on independence, um, his novels, poems, these are things that people should be reading if you're interested in the Southern literary tradition. If you're in, Look, literature reflects a people, and Barry reflects an older Southern society. Not again, socially he's, he's on the left, but this idea of land and people and place, there's a reason why people love reading Southern literature, because it has that real story to it. As I said, it's, it, Alexander's piece is more poetic. She gives you that in the piece on Monday. It's very uh, tied into this, this, uh, this Southern society, the Southern place and people, the human side of it. What is the human cost of urbanism? What is the human cost of centralization? These are questions that the Southern tradition can answer. Jefferson was talking about these. Taylor was talking about this. I mean, Southerners and the old Republican tradition, Republican with a small, you know, lowercase r, were talking about these things. And so this is where uh, people like Wendell Berry are essential reading if you're interested in literature. Now, there's others. I mean, just don't read Wendell Berry. But uh, I do know one of the people that we've actually published on the, through his blog, but we've, we've republished some of the pieces, owns a, a farm. Um, and they're, they're a organic, agrarian. They live an agrarian lifestyle. And they live in Georgia. And he'll tell you, he reads everything Wendell Berry. I mean, it was Wendell Berry that was his guy, and um, they're young. I mean, these they're they're now in their thirties. They started this in their twenties, but they're in their thirties, and they're they're just they're they're making it through and and uh, living the agrarian lifestyle. And they they were influenced by Wendell Berry. It's a hard life. I mean, being a farmer is not an easy life. It's easier not to be a farmer, but uh, it does have a satisfying end to it. Now, one of the reasons why Jefferson has essentially been eliminated from American society or conversation is because of the uh, myth, and it is a myth, that Jefferson fathered all of Sally Hemings' children. I remember when I was watching the HBO miniseries John Adams, when Je at the end of the miniseries, when Jefferson and Adams die, when Jefferson is on his deathbed, the only person in the room is Sally Hemings. Of course, she's portrayed as being rather dark-skinned, 
uh, when we know from historical evidence she could probably pass for Caucasian, for white. But regardless, it was just it took the myth of, uh, of a story that doesn't have a tremendous amount of concrete evidence, that is a whole, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even pass the smell test in a court of law. It was created by James Callender, who was essentially a tabloid writer of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, it was taken and run with by a historian who now has an Ivy League position because of the book. But is it true? And that did Jefferson father any children with Sally Hemings? The only child that has any type of DNA evidence is Eston Hemings. And that just says a Jefferson male fathered a child with Sally Hemings. It doesn't say Thomas Jefferson. It says a Jefferson male. So historians have gone back and tried to figure out if, well, if it could be Thomas Jefferson. Well, anything is possible. But the evidence actually, and as the a scholars commission was put together to investigate all of the available evidence back in the 1990s, and they released a wonderful pamphlet on this, and they said, all of them said, that they don't believe it was Jefferson, though one of the scholars said that Jefferson could be a primary candidate. But the other scholars, and these are not these are not lightweights. I mean, Forrest McDonald was on this commission, and Forrest McDonald would never be confused as a Jeffersonian. Forrest McDonald was always a Hamiltonian. He wrote a wonderful history of Jefferson's presidency. In fact, it's one of the best. And the reason it's one of the best is because he was perhaps more objective than anyone else. I mean, and he, so, he said in the preface, look, I'm a Hamiltonian, and I really didn't want to write this book, but I have a, now have a newfound begrudging respect for Thomas Jefferson based on his research into Jefferson's presidency and who he was. Of course, Forrest MacDonald was, in many ways, the dean of American colonial historians for years. So here is Forrest MacDonald saying Jefferson's not the father. He's investigated all the evidence Jefferson's not the father. He's not Dumas Malone. Dumas Malone had a vested interest in saying Jefferson wasn't the father. And, Je and Dumas Malone, of course, got into this a little bit in his multi-volume work on Thomas Jefferson. But uh, then you have Annette Gordon-Reed who says, look, Jefferson's the father. And because that's PC, because, oh my gosh, here you go. Jefferson was engaged in illicit activity with his slaves, a woman that... Uh, you know, he never remarried. Of course, he's going to father children with her. I mean, this is just natural. We got James Callender saying these things. Well, of course, all this just happened. And so now Jefferson is called all kinds of horrible names. And he is vilified by the left. This is a man that was for years considered to be the hero of the left, right? Thomas, you had Jefferson and Hamilton. The right often claimed Hamilton and the left claimed Jefferson. Uh, you had Franklin Roosevelt signing off on a Jefferson memorial during... And, of course, those in New England hated the fact they were going to have a Jefferson Memorial. Uh, but regardless, we got one. And that was kind of a concession of the South in Washington, D.C. But certainly, um, you have this uh, position that uh, Jefferson is, uh, you know, the, uh, the man that the left loves to despise because he's, he's, he embodies this Southern in their mind, the Southern tradition of abuse and repression because of these children. Now, of all of Hemings' children, she had six. Only one has any DNA evidence to the Jefferson line. So where are the other five? And this is where H.L. Dallas uh, gets into this. He says, well, I mean, if there's five other children, well, what's going on here? How do we know that Hemings, obviously, uh, and we don't know who the other five, the, the fathers of the other five children are, or did they have five different fathers, the same father? I mean, we don't know anything about this. So what does that say about Sally Hemings? And the evidence points more to Randolph Jefferson, who was Jefferson's younger brother, than anyone else. But uh, because Jefferson's a possibility, everyone just runs with it. And of course, now you have the UVA students trying to cover up Jefferson's statue and take Jefferson out of UVA. I mean, this is, this is just absolutely ridiculous. Charlottesville is saying we're going to get rid of Jefferson, we're not going to celebrate Jefferson anymore. I mean, it's lunacy in reality. But this goes back to where Jefferson now, because Jefferson is bad, the Southern tradition is bad, and because, uh, or agrarianism is bad, take your, I mean, whatever it is, Jefferson embodies these bad things. Uh, and this is, this is where we are in 2019. 
This is why the Abbeville Institute has to exist to promote. But I think that Dallas does a great job in pointing out all the inconsistencies in the Tom and Sally story and concludes that it's just not true. Um, anything is possible in this story. I mean, it is a Jefferson mail, but it's not probable. I wrote about this in my Politically Incorrect Guide to the Founding Fathers. Um, anything is possible, but not probable. And then we finish the week with a piece that's not really in line with what we normally do. It actually focuses on an Adams. And this piece I found interesting. Um, it's by Gerald Lefergy, and it's on Charles Francis Adams. Senior, who was a staunch abolitionist. He was a staunch union man. I mean, this is a man that served in the Lincoln administration. Um, he really didn't like the South a whole lot. Um, he is the grandson and son of former presidents John and John Quincy Adams. And I found this piece interesting because um, of what he said about the South during the war. When he was pressed early in the war about how the South was doing and they were winning a lot, um, he said this when they asked him about that. When he asked about what his thoughts were on the victories of the Rebel Army, his reply was a hallmark of patriotism. I think they have been won by my fellow countrymen. Lafergie says, rather than to extol virtue in public manner, Adams had summoned the quiet reserve to find and attest to the goodness, no matter how minor or obscure, in his adversaries. So he says, this is patriotism. This is patriotism. He said Southerners were his fellow countrymen. And even though he was certainly against the war and against secession and for, favored prosecuting the war and defeating the South, he viewed Southerners as his countrymen. And this is the spirit of reconciliation that we no longer have. Um, and as Lafergie says, in our contemporary times, the study of history and historiography has seemingly taken on a form of increased division. In order to attempt to regain respecting the difference, difference between patriotism and nationalism and the value of reconciliation, the memory and examination of the heroic and quiet courage of Charles Francis Adams must stand as an exemplar. What must be the message of his echo with regards to his countrymen today? That they are all Americans. And it is in this very vein of patriotism that all citizens of the world might find inspiration. So, his countrymen. I think that this is something that we forget. And it's, it's really the attack on Confederate monuments in the South. and It's really, a, it's really an anti-reconciliation message. It's, it's the, it is the radicalism of Reconstruction manifested in 2019, in the 21st century. This is really what we're dealing with now. And so when you publish pieces by Alexander or Williams, and they talk about this Southern culture, and you, and you look at the Jefferson Hemings myth, and you, and you take all of this together, the real issue here is reconciliation. There is a strong faction in American society that does not want to reconcile with the South, does not want to consider anything, any Southerner, to be worthwhile. I mean, this is Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables. This is what is happening in society. It is an anti-reconciliation message. There is a certain snobbery. The only people in America that are worthy of scorn and ridicule are Southerners, particular white Southerners. Um, and so this is what Eugene Genovese called a cultural atrocity. Eugene Genovese could stand up and say that because he was one of the most important Southern historians in America, and he was respected by both the left and right. So he had a certain amount of, of capital that he could say these things. Um, but this is true. I mean, look, it is a cultural atrocity what's being done to the South, that you cannot be proud of being from the South, that there's nothing valuable in the Southern tradition. There's nothing valuable to say about it. It's all just a bunch of race and slavery. This is just simply not true. Which is, again, why we tried to promote 
Jeffersonian views and sensibilities. But even that, Jefferson is being attacked as being uh, someone who has to be eradicated from society because he was just a hypocrite slave owner. So I think the most important thing we can get out of this is that that agrarian tradition, the agrarian tradition is necessary and vital for the future of America. And people recognize it, and they feel it, and they know it. And because of that, uh, I, maybe we can see a resurgence sometime in the future. But this is, again, why the Institute exists, why we, why we encourage you to support the Institute and what we do. Share our material on social media. Share our articles. Share our podcast. Come to our events. Contribute financially if you can, even if it's just a small monthly donation. Because we are standing in the breach of what is uh, one of the most important parts of the American culture war, and that is preserving this Southern tradition for future generations. Until next time, good day.